I was a trainee park ranger up here in Washington, I used to patrol this one trail that was popular with some nearby college students. The campus was maybe only 30 or 40 minutes walk away from this particular trail, which was fairly short and set into the northeastern edge of the park, so some weekends the trail would be dotted with groups of students partaking in a little wholesome outdoor exercise. Occasionally you'd get a group doing something not so wholesome, either drinking or just making a general nuisance of themselves, but for the most part, the hikers among them tended to be polite and well-behaved. Although they didn't exactly run like clockwork, there was one particular time when the trail would almost always be completely deserted. Due to even the most studious college kids' propensity for drinking, Saturday mornings were, without a doubt, the quietest time of the week. On the rare occasion you did see anyone, it was usually someone a little older, sometimes a couple, but never anyone college-aged. So this one very early morning when I suddenly spot someone ahead of me on the trail that looked a lot like a college kid, it definitely raised an eyebrow. You might be wondering how someone looks like a college kid. Well, first-time hikers tend to look unprepared in both their equipment and their clothing, and this girl had no pack and wore something that looked better suited to a Friday night party than a Saturday morning's hike. She was also walking at a particularly slow pace, the kind of pace that says, I thought this was a good idea, but now I want to go home, which is very typical of first-time college-age hikers who bite off a little more than they can chew. She's walking so slowly that I start wondering if she's still drunk from the night before or something. Every so often, she'd stumble or sway slightly, and this made me increasingly concerned as I caught up with her. I also happened to notice that her clothes looked pretty dirty, almost like she'd either fallen or had taken a dirt nap of some kind. It also looked like she was sweating a phenomenal amount. Her hair was wet and stringy, and there was a big dark patch around her back and shoulders where the fabric was clinging to her wet skin. She was obviously in a really bad way. I just had no idea how bad her condition actually was. When it got to the point where I was only about 10 to 15 feet behind her, she still hadn't turned around to notice me, and I knew just silently passing her might scare her half to death so I figured I'd just wish her a good morning just to announce my presence. But as soon as I do that, the girl turns around and I just about jump back in horror at what I saw. The girl had a horrific head wound above her eye, and the eye itself was so completely caked with blood that I'm not sure she could see out of it. Someone had seriously tried to cave this girl's head in, and the fact that she was still walking around seemed like nothing short of a miracle. As soon as she laid her one good eye on me, she just sort of collapsed down onto her butt, reaching up to me and croaking, water, water, over and over again. I rushed to give her some water, then radioed into HQ to get her some medical attention, but as I did so, a certain smell hit my nostrils. It was as intense as it was recognizable, and it suddenly hit me that whatever she'd been through was no accident. She wasn't soaked with sweat. Someone had poured gasoline on her. I kept asking her what had happened, but she couldn't seem to get any words out. She just kept drinking more and more water, then staring off into the distance like she was on the verge of going into shock. The only thing she said to me before passing out was, My friends. Which scared me, thinking that there were more kids hurt or dangers somewhere out there on the trail. I kept thinking that she was going to die right there on the trail with me, but... She still had a pulse when a co-worker with an ATV stretcher trailer showed up, and as far as I knew, she was still alive when the EMT showed up to rush her to the hospital. Myself and the rest of the ranger team then spent the rest of the morning combing through the woods around the northeastern trail, looking for any signs of the poor girl's friends. All we found was a doused campfire, with a few empty beer and liquor containers surrounding it, but the ranger who found it was quick to add that the place reeked of gasoline. We didn't get the full story until a week or so later and knowing what actually happened to the girl made her only words to me, my friends, seem all the more haunting. She wasn't saying it because she was worried about them. It was more a case of her asking why people she believed were her friends would do something so awful to her. Yep, there had been no ambush of some innocent college kids by some masked horror movie psycho. This girl's own friends had lured her out into the woods, beat her half to death, then tried to set her on fire. I found out later that the only thing that stopped them from actually lighting her on fire was that someone's lighter wasn't working. The group then tried to light a stick on fire using their campfire, but 
It was a slow process, and by the time they'd made themselves a torch, their victim had managed to run off into the woods and hide. She stayed put for a few hours, drifting in and out of consciousness, and finally got enough adrenaline going to try to make her way out of the woods. And that's when I found her, and knowing she'd get the help she needed, her body just shut down again. They attacked her over some stupid love triangle too, the ringleader having a crush on a guy who had a crush on the victim in turn. Jealousy boiled over, and I guess the alcohol fueled the violence, but a group of college kids legitimately conspired to burn one of their peers alive, all because of a teenage crush. That's the scariest thing in the world to me, and so utterly terrifying because I just can't understand it. The guilty parties all got arrested and kicked out of college, then most were handed lengthy prison sentences after a pretty well-publicized trial. My ranger team was glued to the radio during radio news breaks for two weeks, desperate for any news, and that's how we came to know the horrifying extent of what had occurred that night. The encounter that morning and the eventual discovery of what happened to that poor girl made for the more frightening and disturbing moments of my career. There are some real scary places out there in the woods, all right but there's a kind of innocence to grizzlies and mountain lions. They'll kill you to survive. Whereas people, on the other hand, people kill just to watch each other die. For the past four years or so, I've worked as a full-time park ranger for the British National Trust. Established almost 130 years ago, the National Trust is the largest heritage conservation society in the United Kingdom, and its job is to look after places of a historic significance or natural beauty across the country. This includes everything from old stately homes to national parks, and since I grew up in County Down here in Northern Ireland, my career as a park ranger inevitably saw me posted to the Mourne Mountains. The mountains encompass a few different forests and parks that come under the jurisdiction of the National Trust, Silent Valley, Tollymore, and Ross Trevor, to name a few. But since they're all in an area that's only about 50 miles across, they're all under the remit of the team I'm a member of. I said I've been a ranger for four years, but I did my training around Morn too, and since I was raised just north in Lurgan, I knew the area like the back of my hand by the time it came to my ranger promotion. My experience meant that team members would often come to me if they needed any expert advice on local terrain and navigation, which is how I ended up getting a phone call early one morning from a colleague in need of assistance. She'd had a call from someone she described as a very upset camper who'd woken up at dawn to find a couple of dead sheep outside his tent. That's the phrase my colleagues used, a couple. And since sheep have a nasty habit of turning up dead for a multitude of reasons, I didn't think too much of it. As I might have touched on, the reason my colleague had asked for my help was because I'd have a much better chance than her of actually finding where the guy was camped, and as much as I was willing to lend a hand, I was curious as to why the camper couldn't just lead my colleague back to his camp. My colleague replied something to the effect of, it's not that he can't go back, it's that he won't go back. Honestly, he seems terrified. This really piqued my interest because, although a few dead sheep definitely isn't the most pleasant thing to wake up to, I couldn't see how someone would be terrified of it. Then add the fact that they're too scared to even go back to their campsite to collect their belongings. As I said, it piqued my interest. From the fairly vague description I was given by my colleague, I was able to roughly pinpoint the area where the guy's camp had been. If he'd been pitched at a marked campsite, it would have been much easier to find and a much more public affair. But since he was wild camping or rambling, as some folks say, he'd basically pitched his tent in the middle of nowhere with very little to go on in terms of location aside from near such and such field. While out searching, I got my colleague on the phone again who still had the terrified camper with them down at our Morn Country Park office and basically asked her to rinse the guy for information. According to him, after coming across the horrifying scene, he basically run all the way from his campsite to Morn Country Park. He hadn't run all the way, and had slowed his pace when he felt that he put himself at a safe distance. And because it was so early in the morning, he'd had to walk past a few other homes and businesses before he saw anything that could help him. 
I asked why he hadn't just called someone from his campsite, but the camper repeated that he'd been terrified and hadn't bothered to grab anything before fleeing the area. At this point, as I'm driving around on speakerphone, I start wondering just how many dead sheep it takes to scare someone who was apparently well into middle age. It wasn't some scared kid my colleague had with her. He was older than me by the sounds of things. So I told my colleague to ask him exactly how many dead sheep had been outside his tent. The reply came back, I don't know. The guy couldn't even guess. He only added, it was a mess up there and that I should take a gun of some kind with me if I'm the one investigating. I only overheard that last part. My colleague didn't entertain the idea by repeating it to me. I don't know what it's like for park rangers over in America, but 99% of national park staff remain completely unarmed at all times and have absolutely no access to firearms of any kind. We just don't really need it. We don't have any kind of crazy wildlife that necessitates that kind of kit. So, some guy saying that I need to take a gun with me just sounded like complete and utter hysteria. I ended up talking to him personally and I got him to describe his campsite as best he could in painstaking details if possible. He tried his best, but nothing seemed to click until he mentioned how on his first day's walk he passed a large body of water that looked to be in a kind of C shape. The only large lake or reservoir in the Morns shaped like that is the Spelga Dam, and with the camper saying that he pitched his tent only 5 or 10 minutes walk from the very obvious source of fresh water, that narrowed down my search area by quite a bit. Then, after playing a little mental game of where would I camp near Spelga, I decided to drive over to check out two distinct places with great cover and concealment. The first one was no good, but the second one was a bingo. I see a bright red tent sitting among some trees up ahead of me. The guy had chosen to camp among some trees, meaning I couldn't see much from a distance, dead sheep included. But after trudging across a muddy field and hopping a fence, I finally got a good look at what had scared the camper so much. And let me tell you, it put the fear of God into me too. From what I could gather, the reason why the man had been unable to give us an exact number of dead sheep is because there were bits and pieces of wool, flesh, and bone strewn all over his campsite. It was mind-bogglingly upsetting to look at. I'd never seen anything like it in all my life, let alone during the course of my ranger career. I had to count the sheep's skulls, or what I could at least guess were the remains of their skulls to get an accurate number, and I counted four eviscerated sheep around that man's campsite. Four. There was little wonder he'd been so terrified, having a sight like that be the first thing greeting him in the morning. I'd consider myself quite hardy when it comes to things like that, but sweet baby Jesus, even I found myself shaken having come across that scene. As soon as I was able, I contacted another colleague of mine, told them exactly where the campsite was, and then asked them to lock the place down so we could secure the scene. I know it seems a bit over the top going all CSI over a few sheep, but if something like that happens, we have to ensure there's some degree of evidence preservation so we can at least get an idea of what happened. Then, while they got with that, I intended to drive over to Morn Country House to have a chat with our frightened camper. I had a number of questions for him, things I wanted to hear with my own ears and not via my colleague over the phone. When I arrived, the guy was still quite shaken up sitting in the little porta cabin in the car park that serves as the National Trust office for Morn Country House. My colleague, Jane, had already given him about three or four cups of tea and was only happy to make me one too before I got to asking my questions. They were irrelevant, really. I was confident we'd find out everything we needed to know from the scene, but I was very curious as to how the guy didn't wake up during the night. Obviously, he didn't have much of an answer for me. I asked him if he was a heavy sleeper and he said he didn't think so, then added that he believed someone had dumped the sheep's remains there as a kind of warning. I asked him if he angered or annoyed anyone during his trip, but again, he said he didn't think so. It was definitely curious, but the guy was being of very little help, so I thought I'd just crack on with the next task at hand, which was trying to find out which farmer had four sheep missing. It was still very much a possibility that the four sheep had managed to break out of a pen somewhere, went on the run, and then got attacked by a dog or a pair of foxes. Stranger things than that have happened round more. 
I can assure you, but few things as strange as what I was dealing with that day. We quickly found the farm which all four missing sheep had come from, so I drove over to have a word with the farmer and to have a check on his fences. And this is where the story starts to get really weird. We were already at weird with the dead sheep right next to the camp, but this next part catapulted the situation way past a head scratcher and in a territory which was downright unsettling to me. The farmer in question told me that four sheep had indeed gone missing from his farm, only they'd done so for over the past two weeks, one going missing every couple of nights. What's more, the farmer was only too happy for me to inspect his fences for him because he'd been up the wall with them for weeks and he couldn't work out where the sheep were getting out. I could hardly claim to be an expert on the matter, but I gave his fences a check anyways, and just like he said, he turned the place into a bloody fortress of wood stakes and chicken wire. The farmer himself then told me that he was convinced someone was stealing a sheep somehow. A sheep going missing was an irritatingly common occurrence, but then four sheep going missing over the course of two weeks, then all turning up dead and slashed up in the exact same place. Something was obviously going on, but sadly, it was something we never got to the bottom of. The scene was cleared up, with a wildlife expert stopping by to tell us that the wounds to the sheep were in too bad of a condition to properly analyze. We'd never know if it was an animal or a person that had done those horrible things, just one of the many things that continues to bother me all these years later. When the farmer heard exactly how his sheep had died, he pressed for us to investigate the camper for animal cruelty. His assertions are reasonable in many ways, but four dead sheep don't really make it big on the local police's radar and we had no idea where the camper went after that, so there was no arresting or questioning him. Besides, the PS and I have got enough on their plate without investigating bloody sheep murders, and the only papers it's got more than a few lines in was a bloody regional farmer's monthly that put it down to foxes or stray dogs. It was baffling to me. There was obviously something more to the whole thing, yet... Everyone but me and a handful of my colleagues either didn't know enough or didn't care enough to actually look into it properly. All the higher-ups wanted to do was chalk it up to a spike in the local fox population, but no one who'd actually witnessed the carnage up at that campsite could possibly claim that foxes did that. The only real feedback or reaction we got from the National Trust or the RSPB was to keep an eye out for any large escaped dogs and other such predators. We all found that last part a wee bit ominous, but it was ultimately inconsequential. There was no hound of the Baskervilles-type creature roaming the Mourn Mountains, but no formal investigation helped us figure out what actually happened. Of all the things that I've seen or experienced during my time working for the National Trust, the incident with the dead sheep is the one thing that still sends shivers down my spine whenever I think about it. But it's not what I know about it that scared me. It's what I don't know that keeps me up at night sometimes, even all these years later. Hello, Let's Read. My name is Radim, and I am what you might call a park ranger here in my home country, Slovakia. I'm writing to you because I want to explain to you something that is happening in my country and it is happening in one particular area in Slovakia. For some backstory, Slovakia is a country in the middle of Europe. The biggest mountains here are the Carpathian Mountains, and Tribec is part of the Carpathian Mountains. Tribec is a relatively small and not very high mountains in the shape of a triangle, and is located in the west side of the country. There are some very dangerous tall mountains here in Slovakia, like the Tatras Mountains, and these are dangerous because of bad weather and rock slides and wild animals. Tribec is not like that. The climate is moderate. No tornadoes, no earthquakes. It just looks like a calm, normal place. But it's not calm, and it's not normal. For some, Tribec is a very dangerous place. There is a whole series of missing people in Tribec, people whose bodies have never been found. I believe that most of them could be explained as tragic accidents when animals attacked a victim, preventing the body from being found, but there are other cases when things are not so easily explained. The Trebech disappearances have become a sort of meme or urban legend here in Slovakia, almost like the Bermuda Triangle. 
The disappearances are real, but no one seems to take them seriously anymore. The stranger ones happen so far apart in time that people don't become alarmed. They just shrug their shoulders and say, Oh well, at least it wasn't me. I made a list of some such cases, and I'd like to know your thoughts on them because I think something very frightening is happening here. All the way back in 1929, a man named Mr. A. Samsali went missing on a snowy November day. He just told a neighbor that he wanted to go for a walk and then never came back. The heavy snows made it impossible to search for him properly until the springtime, but by then, it was too late. He had completely disappeared and no dead body was ever recovered. Some say that the man took his own life, as he had a very lonely life with no wife or children, but all agree that the fact that he was never found is very strange because Trebech is so small. Then, in 1939, a man named Walter Fisher went missing. Walter worked in a shoe factory in a small city called Parizansky, on the west of the Trebech Mountains. He worked there for six days every week, then on Sundays, he would visit his wife and children who still lived out in the countryside because they couldn't afford to live in the city. On Sunday of January of 1939, he decided that for some reason he wouldn't visit his family, but rather go for a hike in the forest around Trebech. According to one of his co-workers, Walter had mentioned that he wanted to visit a place called the Chirni Hrath, which literally means the Black Castle in Slovakian. It is a ruined fortress from many hundreds of years ago, which was built to protect against Hungarian raiders. Some tourists occasionally visit the place, but I don't understand why Walter would make it the destination of his hike. The Black Castle is 25 kilometers from Partizansky, meaning Walter would have to have walked 50 kilometers if he wanted to make it back to his lodgings in time for work the next day. This is not my idea of what a hard-working man like Walter would do on his day off to relax. Rather, it sounds like he had some kind of business at the Black Castle, like he had planned to meet someone there or something like that. It also doesn't make sense that he would choose to go on such a hike in January when the snows make it very, very difficult to move around on foot. Sometime later, Walter's wife reported him missing and he remained a missing person for months and months. Then in May of that same year, Walter Fisher suddenly showed up alive. No one knows what happened to him or where he'd been, but it was clear that in the time that he'd been missing, something terrible had happened to him. When he was found... He was in the middle of a field more than 30 kilometers away from Partizansky, the place that he was last seen, on the complete opposite side of the Trebech Mountains. His clothes were in rags, he was unconscious, and there were reports of him being horribly wounded. Some accounts say the wounds were burns and others say cuts, but it's clear that he was taken to a hospital where he stayed for a long time. Walter said that he had no memory of the time that he was missing but was traumatized and spent the rest of his life in a hospital for people with psychological problems. So what in God's name happened to him in the months he was missing? There are many, many theories on this, some quite believable and some wild and crazy. Most of them involve World War II and how tensions in the run-up to the war led to Walter being accused of being a spy. This would explain why he was wounded but not killed. Someone had been hurting him but also feeding him. Then there are all the theories involving time portals, other dimensions, aliens, or UFOs. These are not things that I believe, so I won't go into them, but the lack of any real answers has led to such fantasies. Personally, I have no idea what exactly happened to Walter, but it was clearly something very, very frightening. Now, the next mysterious disappearance involved a husband and wife in 1966. Their names were Jan and Elena, and in February of 1966... They drove to the city of Yelenet, parked their car near the forest, then apparently went off hiking together. Their car was fine, their friends and family didn't notice anything odd about the way that they were acting before that day either. But still, just like the others, Jan and Elena walked into the forest of the Trebech Mountains and were never seen again. Their case seems to have gotten a lot more attention from newspapers and I read that the whole of Slovakia searched far and wide for the couple. But according to one policeman, it was like they just stepped out of their car, walked into the woods, and completely disappeared. Anyone who knows these particular cases finds them completely baffling. Like I said, there have been many other people go missing in the Trebech, but because it is so small, they get found about 99% of the time with an injury or they got lost, a totally normal explanation. 
But to have these people just completely disappear, and for one to suddenly show up with no memory and strange wounds, it's enough to make the rational people like me wonder what is reality and what's science fiction. It's also very frustrating for me because not a lot of people outside of Slovakia know about the Trebech missing people, and those that do assume that they're just campfire stories because of the Slovak shrug shoulders attitude to them. I'm sure there is a normal explanation for what has happened to these people, but I cannot see it, and that's why I'm trying to get this story to as many English language media as I can. Maybe if enough light is shed on it, the mystery will finally be solved. Many years ago now, I used to work up in Alaska as a member of the park services. One day we had gotten a call about some illegal dumping on one of the local trails, so myself and another employee went out to check it out. We were fairly deep into the trails, not too many people around except for a few joggers when we came around to turn on the path. As we were walking, my partner looked into the woods and said, What in the world? There's a guy there. About 20 yards away, there was a white guy with longish hair crouched behind a bush just kind of staring at us. The man noticed that we had noticed him, and he immediately stood up and stretched out his arms in the air, like he was just enjoying the day. He actually approached us, and it turns out the man that I was with actually knew the man in the woods. He was a local builder or owned a construction company. In fact, he had built a deck for my friend the year prior. After they said their hellos, he mentioned that he just stepped off the path for a moment to take a leak. It was kind of strange, though, because... We had seen him, and that definitely wasn't what he was doing. But he wasn't that suspicious, and my friend knew him, so after making sure that he wasn't illegally dumping or anything of that nature, we just started walking back, and he walked with us for a fair while. A few years later, I heard that the man that we had seen had been arrested. Apparently, there had been some sort of altercation with a girl at a coffee shop, or so I had initially been told, and he had shot her in a robbery and was under arrest for murder. The truth was even more bizarre. The man, Israel Keyes, was a serial killer who had actually abducted, tortured, and murdered the girl. After being arrested, it turns out that he had been traveling around the country murdering people randomly for years. He would bury murder kits and come back sometimes years later to dig them up, and they would include guns, cash, etc., and whatever he needed. I went back later to where we had come across Israel in the woods to see if there was any such a kit buried there, but I didn't find anything. Others suggested that he might have been waiting to surprise a victim on the trail, but that didn't seem to be his general M.O., as was my understanding. Anyway, our encounter is something that I never have totally been able to explain, and since he ended up taking his own life before trial, I likely never will. I've worked as a park ranger for the National Park Service for coming up on 10 years now, and this is the most frightening thing that's ever happened to me. I was driving on a dirt road and just a regular patrol day when I saw a plume of smoke ahead of me. I thought that I might have to call in a fire or something, but when I rounded a bend, I was greeted with the sight of a van parked in the middle of the track, completely engulfed in flames. The tires were melted, things were popping and exploding inside, and it was this raging inferno. I thought someone had just ditched a car and lit it up so I didn't think much of it at first. I called 911 and reported it, then had to drive like a half hour extra to get around it. I find out later that it wasn't abandoned. There had been a guy in the driver's seat. He had to be long dead by the time I showed up so I don't regret not checking it out further. It wasn't an accident though so the car was parked in the middle of the road and it hadn't hit anything. It was eventually ruled that he had actually taken his own life but I really can't imagine how anyone would choose to go that way. It was also a super weird place, not out of the way or right by his house. Now I think about it a lot because it just doesn't seem to make any sense to me outside of some catastrophic engine failure. As weird as it sounds to some, 
My first job out of college was working for the National Park Service as a ranger in training. I was based in NorCal at the time, and the survey protocol we were working had us out on ATVs just after sunset, stopping periodically to mimic owl hoots before listening for their response. One night I was riding my ATV on a logging road that was right along a river. I saw a blur off to the side, and before I knew it, there was a smallish black bear running five feet ahead of my ATV. I immediately slowed down to avoid hitting it, but since it was so small, I thought its mother might still be around, so I was half expecting a mama bear claw on my back. The bear ran ahead of me on the road for probably five seconds, it felt like much longer, before disappearing into the forest on the other side. As soon as the road was clear, I pounded the throttle on the ATV and got out of there. In retrospect, the bear was probably a yearling and no longer with its mother, but in the heat of the moment, it was a terrifying possibility. Click the join button to become a member today for exclusive content. Paul Braxton Fugate was born on September 2nd of 1938 in the New York City borough of Brooklyn. His parents were Texan by birth and at the outbreak of World War II, they returned their family to the Lone Star Estate to settle in a two-bedroom house in Fort Worth. The first of six children, Paul was a precocious child and showed a talent for gardening that pleasantly surprised his parents. He also showed an affinity with animals and once tamed a crow that became his constant but mischievous companion. Paul pushed back against his disciplinarian father and carried a disdain for authority into his early adulthood. He refused to sign a loyalty oath in college and actively protested against the Vietnam War. Paul went his own way, for better or worse. During the summer of 1962, a friend of Paul's sister visited the Fugate home intent on swapping some dance tips with the girls. Dottie and the Fugate sisters knew each other through the Girl Scouts, but upon entering her friend's home that day, Dottie ran into a young man with a crew cut and Buddy Holly glasses. Dottie was only vaguely familiar with Paul, but found herself riveted by an unexpected lesson on Inuit culture, which he delivered with a kind of nerdy panache. It was then that Paul asked Dottie if she'd like to see his gun. This might be a massive red flag for many young women, but it was a calculated move on Paul's part. Dottie was on the women's shooting team at what was then Arlington State College and was a passionate firearms enthusiast. No ideas for dance moves were swapped that day, and Paul's sisters were furious that he had hijacked their friend's visit, but neither Paul nor Dottie cared as each felt the butterflies of a budding romance. Paul's romance with Dottie was just about the only thing he cared about. He worked a variety of odd jobs while studying for a degree that, by his own admission, he didn't really care for. Yet apathy was somewhat ironic, given the fact that Paul was one of the most talented students the university had ever seen. After studying at his university's botany department, one of his supervising professors called him one of the finest students he'd ever worked with, adding that Paul was easily in the top ten students of the past three decades. Paul's reputation among his peers was so great that Following his disappearance, a classmate named a new plant species in his honor, a flowering desert perennial called Amzonia fugadii. Following his graduation, he briefly considered using his degree to secure a well-paid job at Utah's Dugway Proving Ground, but at the moment of truth, he changed his mind. Paul wanted freedom, independence, and the loving embrace of Mother Nature, and with that in mind, he applied for the National Park Service instead. Following Paul and Dottie's wedding in December of 1964, Paul went to work at the Carlsbad Caverns in New Mexico. After New Mexico, the Fugates were stationed at the sandstone canyons of Arizona's Navajo National Monument, home of the Batatican Cliff Dwelling. It was the kind of lifestyle Paul had always dreamed of, but it was far from perfect. Paul's superiors were everything he loathed, and they once chastised him for his anti-authority streak his laziness, and his personal appearance. If you want to look and live like a hippie, that is certainly your prerogative, but not here at Navajo National Monument, one wrote, furious that he couldn't just fire the man. Instead, in 1970, the Park Service transferred Paul to another national park instead, the Shirikawa's National Monument, where he and Dottie would spend the next ten years of their lives in relative bliss. 
Then, on Sunday, January 13th of 1980, Paul stepped out of the Shirakawa Visitor Center, wearing his standard Park Service uniform and red winged boots and carrying a green down parka. I'm going to do a trail, he announced to a co-worker, adding that if he wasn't back by 4.30, she should close up without him. Little did this co-worker know, it was the last time anyone would see Paul again. By 8 p.m., the same worried co-worker contacted the park superintendent, who in turn joined his subordinates in searching the surrounding area. The rangers covered a lot of ground, calling out Paul's name all the while, but eerily, there were no signs of him anywhere. The following morning, the park superintendent contacted the Cochise County Sheriff's Office to officially report Paul missing. Law enforcement then organized an intensive search and rescue effort consisting of almost 30 rangers and police officers, with the team soon joined by a National Guard helicopter and 16 volunteers from the Southern Arizona Rescue Association. The official search effort lasted just over two weeks, but Dottie organized volunteer search groups for months, then eventually years afterwards. They walked the trails, checked abandoned mines, held benefit concerts, and badgered local politicians, but sadly, their efforts have so far never borne fruit, and the only real theory is a grim one. A criminal investigator for the sheriff's department had purported that Paul may have been the victim of a drug deal gone wrong. Since Cochise County shares 80 miles of border with Mexico, the area is well-traveled by drug smugglers and human traffickers, and it was suggested that a chance encounter with such criminals might have ended very very badly for the gregarious Paul. Yet without any solid evidence of such an attack or abduction, all anyone could do was wait, wonder, and hope. Paul remains the only Park Service Ranger ever to go missing and never be accounted for, and over the years, his unsolved disappearance has haunted everyone it's touched. A retired detective who once worked the case officially now investigates Paul's disappearance on his own time traveling around the state and re-interviewing sources, and in 2018, the reward for information was raised from 20000 to 60000 At one point, a heartbroken but resolute Dottie brought in a psychic who immediately detected what she called a time portal inside a home Paul used to frequent. This psychic also claimed that she'd had a vision of two men bending over a woman's drugged, unconscious body. Paul was in the vision, Witnessing something he shouldn't, and after apprehending him, the two men shoved a drug down his throat and dumped him across the Mexican border. Dottie seemed shaken by the psychic's so-called vision, not because she was a believer in the supernatural, but because it was a disturbingly familiar story. In 2014, a Park Service employee named Karen Gonzalez was assaulted and nearly killed by an alleged drug smuggler from Mexico. The incident happened within spitting distance of where Paul was last seen, meaning the murder was perhaps Dottie's single biggest clue as to the fate of her husband. Yet Dottie has long feared that her husband had suffered some kind of violent death. Just five days after he went missing, Dick Horton, a Park Service volunteer in his 50s, came forward with a crucial piece of information, one which would set the tone of the investigation for years to come. Around the time of Paul's disappearance, Dick had been out driving with his wife when he'd spotted Paul slump between two men in a pickup truck which seemed to be rapidly fleeing the area. One police officer found Dick's story so compelling that he asked him to undergo deep hypnosis in order to recall minute details of what he'd witnessed. Dick recalled the pickup was a dark green color with a camper shell. The driver was in his 30s, had a trimmed beard, and was wearing a black and red flannel shirt. The second man wore a green jacket, one eerily similar to the one Paul wore as part of his ranger uniform. According to Dick... Paul himself looked sad and dejected and appeared to be nursing some kind of minor head injury. If what Dick had witnessed was Paul's abduction by drug traffickers or people smugglers, his hesitancy to come forward meant that any guilty parties would essentially have an entire week's head start. However, the fact remains that aside from one solitary witness statement, there is no solid evidence to place Paul in anyone's truck that day. In the words of one detective, we build cases on what we know, and that's not a lot right now. All we know is that Paul's missing, but there's no evidence to tell us anything else. By the summer of 1980, the swirl of rumor and speculation had condensed into two basic theories. 
The first was mostly propagated by a Park Service investigator named Pat Hanley, who believed that Paul had simply walked out on his career and marriage and that his disappearance was voluntary. He cited what he referred to as Paul's flagging career prospects, as well as something much seedier than the investigation had shed light on. After more than a decade of marriage, Paul had started an affair with a 19-year-old colleague, one that had resulted in unexpected pregnancy. The young lady was forced to seek an abortion, so there was no reason for Paul to flee child support payments and the like, but it's possible that the shame and heartache drove him to seek a new life elsewhere. However, one missing persons detective was vocal in his belief that some kind of foul play has caused Paul's disappearance. Criminal investigator Craig Emanuel insisted that following extensive interviews with Paul's wife, the affair and his career prospects were irrelevant. Paul was content with his life, and he would never have just walked out on Dottie unless he was under duress. Emmanuel also placed a lot of credence in the witness statement of Dick Horton and suggested that Dick may have witnessed Paul being disappeared by the foot soldiers of some kind of smuggling ring. Emmanuel also pointed out that in the months following Paul's disappearance, he had received an anonymous block print letter telling him to ask Ernest Goff in the county jail in Phoenix about Mr. Fugate. The following year, another letter in the same style claimed that a man by the name of Tex Carpenter had been involved in Paul's murder. Carpenter initially agreed to take a polygraph test in October of 1981, but changed his mind during the pre-test interview after three hours of discordant hectoring. During this rant, Carpenter swore that he'd seen two men shoot Paul and had even helped bury him in a dry gulch just south of Tucson. However, just two weeks later, Carpenter denied having said any of the sort, and apparently under pressure from his prison's chapter of the Aryan Brotherhood, Carpenter later said that he might know something about Paul's disappearance, but wouldn't talk unless he got some kind of deal. Ernest Goff, on the other hand, denied any involvement whatsoever and refused to answer any questions unless formally charged with the crime. Both men have since died, meaning any such leads might well have gone to their graves with them. Some have even suggested that Dottie herself was involved in her husband's disappearance, with many theories based around a rather untimely inquiry. Just two weeks after Paul vanished, Dottie asked how long she would have to wait before getting Paul's retirement benefits. She was told the inquiry was a little premature, as the authorities were still hopeful that Paul would be found alive. Dottie replied that she was simply preparing for the worst. I wasn't making much money when I asked about his retirement benefits, Dottie later said. It was just one of those things you do. The inquiry apparently led to her being asked to undergo a polygraph test, and although it was implied to be a fairly informal and friendly interview, Dottie showed up with a lawyer, a close friend, and a tape recorder. Despite her somewhat suspicious behavior, the police examiner felt that Dottie was being truthful in her claim that she was innocent of any involvement. Yet the result didn't explain a number of other curious details which investigators found interesting. At Paul's cabin, Investigators found an unfinished life insurance application and a check Dottie had written to Paul from their joint bank account. This had been used to suggest that Dottie and Paul were about to attempt some kind of life insurance scam, but even if this wasn't the case, a few pieces of correspondence seemed to suggest Paul knew that his life was in danger. In one of Dottie's file boxes, police found a letter that Paul had written to her, along with a handwritten will. It was dated December 23, 1978, just over a year before he went missing. You won't be opening this unless something bad has happened, or at least I hope not, it began. I have done what I could to see that you can be self-sufficient and believe that is possible now. I know that I've been a long way from perfect and all and seem to have got worse as time has passed, but still I love you dearly. Paul left specific advice on selling some of his rifles and giving him a cheap burial. He also emphasized that the best strategy for her to claim his government death benefits before adding that she had the proper talents to succeed without him. Some have interpreted this as evidence of collusion and insist that Dottie is well aware of Paul's secretive but continued existence. Dottie, on the other hand, has stated that if Paul really was alive, there's no way she'd be able to live apart from him, nor would she be able to hide her joy or fake such a deep, long-lasting grief. Since the disappearance of her husband, Dottie Fugate has never been romantically involved with another man, and her best friend in the world is none other than Paul's young sister. 
Paul remains the only national park ranger in US history to be the victim of an unexplained disappearance, but maybe that's because he doesn't want to be found. Yet in all likelihood, Paul's fate remains a mystery to this day because someone else didn't want him found. After all, dead men tell no tales. I work as a park ranger here in New Mexico, and a few years back, we were dealing with a particularly vicious outbreak of wildfires. We were working with this group of wildland firefighters, coordinating and supplying the various teams in our non-stop, no-sleep fight to put the fires out. On the incident maps, it's common to make notations of areas that are considered sensitive. This can range from areas with suspected and known endangered species, known pot farms, and Native American land with cultural significance. So, we were late into our shift. Can't even recall what day we were on because typically assignments can last up to 14 to 28 days depending on our need for resources. We were working with a Native American crew because our division went through culturally sensitive land and everything was going good. Darkness fell and it was coming up on break time eventually. We were all dead tired, sucking in smoke all day, little sleep, it was pretty normal actually. Fire was pretty much out in our area, minus a few hot spots that just needed mopping up. As I was sitting against a tree, all of our normal radio traffic turned to nothing but static, which is totally common in areas that are out there. Fighting the urge to sleep, I got one of those moments that just wakes you up. Like when you wake up from a dream where you're falling, it was like that. But there were these figures, similar to the ghost of Obi-Wan, it was like they would walk behind a tree and disappear. Nobody else saw it, but... I've heard similar stories before. I'm not a person who really believes in ghosts or paranormal stuff. I feel like it was real, but I do my best to believe that it was just hallucinations from lack of sleep. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm Eastern Standard Time. If you've got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, we got Xbox and Pepsi. We're fine.